Okay, great. So I think people are all here, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and kick things off. Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Petticone. I'm the president and co-founder of the Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all here to our free public online lecture, which we started during the pandemic, and we will continue to do long after because it's been a wonderful success. Um, it's um, a pleasure uh, to have our uh, speaker, who is someone who I greatly admire, uh, Diana Smith here today to talk to us about um, classical education. Um, but we also have a, a, a lovely uh, synergy is what I think the, the cool kids call it these days, where uh, uh, one of our employees, Jamel Darty, who is our uh, head of curriculum design here at Paidea, got her start teaching in the Washington Latin School um, and working with Diana. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Jamel um, to have her introduce. All right. Go ahead, Jamel. Can you not unmute yourself? Let me remedy that situation. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, should be able to do it now. No? No? Hold on. Ask to unmute. Okay, I think it's working right. now. All right. All right. Um, yes, so when I heard Diana Smith would be um, giving a lecture, I jumped at the chance to be the one to get to introduce her. So I'm delighted to be that, that person. Diana was the principal of Washington Latin Public Charter School in DC for 13 years, um, where I had the privilege, as Jason said, um, to teach under her mentorship um, as the fifth grade Latin teacher. So I know she's recently retired, but keeps getting drawn back into it, um, as Washington Latin is now opening a, a second campus. And I see her on, on emails for consulting with the administration. And I think the, the part that she's definitely consulting with is how to transfer and maintain the, the culture of the original school to the new one, which was a very unique aspect of the school. Um, it was a culture that was intentional and intellectual, um, I'm very hopeful and I do miss my community and fellow Washington Latin people. So say hello to you too. Uh, there are a lot of rumors. I know um, when we were working at Washington Latin about the history of uh, its founding, um, because it did have a rough start from a very different founder. Um, everyone would wear Harry Potter-esque robes to teach in. Um, and they taught in a large cafeteria room that was separated with dividers, became known as the Thunderdome. Uh, so it has this kind of mythology and, and legend, um, but we all know that when Diana came aboard, she righted the ship and um, led the school to greatness, shall we say. Um, it's a, a golden ticket now in the Washington DC area. Um, everyone uh, is very excited to, to be a part of the school if they're accepted, um, which is open. It's really just a lottery system. Um, so Without further ado, I'm excited to hear what Diana has to say today um, about classical education. Um, so I will turn it over to Dr. Diana Smith, everyone. Thanks so much, Jamel. And uh, Jason, you call it synergy. I call it theft. You, you stole my really good <laughs> teacher. Uh, but the fact that uh, she's gone on to do great things with you all in the service of things classical is great. So thanks, Jamel. If you ever want to come back, uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, all right, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here. It's good to see some of my uh, colleagues. And I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes or so, I think. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time, I hope, for the give and take that is the hallmark of classical pedagogy, uh, otherwise known as uh, discussion and seminar. Uh, over the years of being in schools, I've found that everyone has opinions about education. And I, I would uh, love to hear what yours are. So uh, I'm coming to you, uh, this is timely. I am coming to you from Miami on the uh, campus of uh, Miami Dade campus, on um, the Kendall campus. And uh, they haven't put me in the white room here. It's just, I've never seen a classroom this clean. Uh, so I'm coming to you from a classroom in uh, Miami where I'm at a conference uh, with a fellow classicist uh, on restoring the heart 
to education is what the name of it is, restoring the heart uh, to education. And my colleague and I, Bill Clausen, who some of you know, uh, are here um, trying to figure out uh, exactly how Washington Latin fits uh, under the rubric of classical schools. Now that may sound odd to you, but um, there are over 800 classical schools in the United States. Uh, and this word, both classical and oddly school, uh, it is not uh, as well defined as one might think. So Bill and I are here um, at this conference. We're, uh, we're attracted by the idea of restoring the heart to education because it's something that we believe in deeply uh, about our school. Uh, but in many ways, we're different from some of the other schools here. And, and uh, there are uh, Christian classical schools here. Uh, there are classical public charter schools here. There are classical private schools here. Uh, all of which are different and and have a different um, have a different feel to them. Uh, that's really important as we start talking about this. So I will say, uh, if you don't know the great Greek word aporia or aporia, um, uh, you should. Uh, it is what Socrates uh, did to his fellow students, to the students rather that he was working with, uh, and he would get them so. Um, unhinged really from their former views uh, and inject new views by asking questions that they were in a state of not really knowing what they believed. And I'm sure this has happened to you uh, in the classroom. It's a great moment where kids take off a filter through which they've been looking at the world with security for many years and all of a sudden start to entertain a new one. Uh, and so I, I am in a slight, I'm right on the edge not suffering fully from the disease called aporia, uh, but I'm close and it's not exactly the, um, uh, the right attitude to have for uh, giving a talk uh, with security. So uh, forgive me if my tone is a little more wondering than, than uh, certain today. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So let me talk uh, just for a bit about the school I love. Uh, Washington Latin Public Charter School, uh, and what makes it a classical school in my mind. And also then, as uh, Jason said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of such a school and uh, the challenges of such a school. We are an unusual school uh, in, in a number of ways. As Janelle said, uh, Jamel said, we, we started um, uh, our life uh, at the vision of a uh, Episcopalian minister um, who really wanted to bring, his, his main idea was to bring a British boarding school to Washington DC to everyone. Uh, and he put in the trappings, as Jamal said, of, of Hogwarts, what we would know as at Hogwarts. Um, uh, robes, white linen tablecloths, uh, lots of little places where there were thank you notes tucked away because he believed deeply, um, none of which I am denigrating, uh, but it will show you that there was a different model loose um, uh, at the school. He was there only for a year and a half, and then um, another woman and I came in, uh, Martha Cutts came in and, and uh, were working at the school. Both of us came from independent schools. Uh, this is an important factor uh, when we came to Washington Latin. So you're gonna hear a little bit today um, about uh, the feel of an independent school that Washington Latin has. So let's start. Let me tell you a little bit about the school, um, uh, just a little, and then uh, I'm gonna talk to you about why I find it um, a classical school because it isn't in some people's minds, a totally uh, committed classical school and others it is very much. Uh, and then I wanna talk um, a little bit about benefits uh, and challenges. So we're a um, public charter school in Washington, DC, grades five through 12, with the tagline, a classical education for the modern world. Classical education for the modern world. There is a purposeful tension there that I will talk about. Educate about 740 students in DC. And if you know DC at all, uh, we educate all eight wards of the city, people from all eight wards. Uh, so what that means is that we are a diverse school. The demographics of the school, 
reflect largely the demographics of the city, which is changing dramatically, but about right now 40% white in our school, 40% African-American and about 20% Hispanic or Latino. Uh, it is a small school. So I knew the names of every single student in the school, 740 kids, um, crucial, crucial uh, that kids be known. It is a small school. Uh, all the students take Latin. Uh, we offer a full liberal arts curriculum and we'll come back to that idea of liberal arts, um, including study in Arabic, Chinese, French, Greek, and Latin. Uh, we've graduated students who've had over six years of language study. Um, we have a full sports program and a full arts program as well. There are uh, quotations from Plato, Aristotle, and other deep thinkers um, on the walls with a special pride of place uh, for the Aristotle quote about the development of excellence as a habit. Uh, and uh, there is an ethos, as Jamal said, of uh, intellectual warmth, uh, I think you could say, uh, when you walk in the school. And uh, we've worked hard to make sure that it is an intellectual place. And I'll come back to that uh, in a second. So that gives you a quick snapshot of who we are. We are opening a second campus. And we're op opening a second campus in the fall of this coming year in temporary space over on 711 Edgewood in a warehouse. Um, uh, we began life at, uh, with our current school in three different churches um, and church basements and everywhere we could find. This new school, which will be called the Anna Julia Cooper campus uh, after an absolutely remarkable woman. If you hear nothing else from today, go look this woman up, Anna Julia Cooper, African-American classicist. She was still a school principal at age 70. She got her uh, degree, her PhD degree at the Sorbonne um, uh, and uh, she began life enslaved. Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to think of a more amazing woman in my mind. Um, and who believed deeply in the classical tradition. So, uh, the school will be called the Cooper Campus and uh, we'll start with just fifth and sixth grades and with about um, 120 students. Her name's Anna Julia Cooper um, and the famous essay called A Voice from the South and we should know more about her. So we'll have two campuses. As Jamel said, uh, the challenge for me right now um, is figuring out how to take the culture uh, that we have created at Second Street um, and, and replicate the parts of it that we wanna replicate and not the parts of it that we don't. And I can talk more about that process if you want to uh, down the road. Um, but I don't know if any of you have tried to transfer culture from one place to another. Um, it's, uh, as we know, culture is squishy uh, and hard to get your hands around. And um, frankly, you know what? I'm uh, the kind of leader that uh, didn't write much down um, and worked in the school just by virtue of what I believe about schools. Uh, and so a lot of, you know, I was there for 13 years and a lot of what the school is about, you absorb a leader after a while. And it's been really challenging for me to think through what actually at a systematic level uh, I was doing. So let's talk about why we are, are classical. That word, um, goodness gracious, that word can summon anything from people thinking that you're a fascist uh, to uh, people thinking that you are um, old fashioned and wonderful. Uh, to people thinking that you're some combination of both. Uh, the word classical is under such an is in such an interesting moment for the word itself. Um, for us, uh, besides the uniforms and the required Latin, uh, which are two overt signs of a classical school, I want to talk to you about something that matters uh, a great deal to us. So let me share my screen for a minute. Um, and So uh, when I um, present to the faculty, uh, I uh, start with um, this slide, a classical school, or what have I gotten myself into? 
Um, and I talk with them uh, about the school that they have joined. Now, as you can imagine, and as I think we'll end up talking about, one of the most challenging things about running a classical school, really any school, but particularly a classical school, is the background of the faculty who come to you. Um, and we do not have all classicists at our school at the moment, uh, because you can't just say to people, you have to go get a... Um, you have to go get a, a, a classical degree in order to work there. So one of the challenges has been trying to figure out how to educate the faculty quickly in a tradition that is ancient um, and that for which, frankly, you, there is no cliff notes, uh, blessedly. Uh, you really have to get steeped in this stuff in order to understand it. So I'm gonna begin uh, with this quotation that I begin with um, and uh, normally, and let me just see, okay. So I was heavenly, um, yeah, heavenly too. I was heavily influenced by uh, a multi-volume work by, uh, called Paideia uh, by a man named Werner Jaeger. Um, if you're a classicist, you know this um, work. If you aren't, um, you should. It, it is an absolutely remarkable uh, German-American scholarship from this man. He was a classicist as an interesting autobiographical note. His wife, uh, Ruth Yeager, who was a, a force of her own nature, uh, was my Latin teacher in high school. So um, I got a lot of um, background uh, from these two. Paideo, which is the word that Jason has chosen for the Institute as well, uh, somewhat untranslatable, um, uh, but uh, the rearing of children, the educating of children, the training of children, the path for educating children. Um, and I begin with our faculty with this. The Greeks were the first to recognize that education means molding human character in accordance with an ideal. Go over this again. The Greeks were the first to recognize that education means molding human character in accordance with an ideal. Now imagine me uh, in a room usually of 20 and 30 year old teachers, um, not all of them with a background in classics who have come often many of them from our best universities and I don't mean to slight them, uh, but an idea like this isn't spoken about a lot in some of our major universities. Um, this is a bit of a, a shock. So let's talk about what's shocking here. First of all, the idea that education is molding, molding, shaping, forming, training, there is uh, in America, which I would argue has a, a, a loose educational theory right now um, in many of our regular public schools, I'm not exactly clear what we're aiming for, and I'll talk about that. But the idea that education is molding, shaping, training, and the uh, Greeks like to talk about the educational metaphors, there were two, training horses and uh, training plants. Uh, by the way, just a sidebar, some good work needs to be done on the metaphor of plants in the history of education because it's been used both by the ancients to mean training a plant as in uh, the English garden style, but it's also been used by the progressives and the romantics in education to mean just letting the thing unfold, letting it grow organically into whatever it's gonna grow into. Those two views, are at odds. For the Greeks, education was training, molding, shaping, partly because they recognized the power of what they called the appetitive spirit, the power of the passions, and they therefore had to be molded or shaped. So that's the first word that I go into with my faculty. The second is character, good Aristotelian word, uh, at this conference, they're encouraging us to think in terms of virtue and not character. Uh, I'm not sure I'm on board yet with that, uh, but I'm thinking about it. But the idea is that, the idea follows here, this is the point, uh, is that education is fundamentally a moral enterprise, that we are shaping human beings to become good people. I'll come back to this in a minute. 
And then, of course, what really throws people off who are children of the 80s, 90s and of, a, of our modern universities in it is this phrase in accordance with an ideal. Education means molding human character in accordance with an ideal. Whose ideal, who's to say, what ideal, ideals don't exist, all the kinds of voices that I get from uh, what we would call a postmodern audience often. So this to me um, is one of the things that decidedly distinguishes Washington Latin. And let me put it this way. We have an end in mind. To the ancient mind, that's teleological. The phrase is teleological. We have a telos. We have an end in mind. And that end is the cultivation of virtue. Now, you might think, if you're not in education, you might think, well, of course. But this is not something that is routinely understood now. And when I get to the part about the challenges that we're dealing with, one of the main challenges is that the telos, if there is one, and if it's explicit, which it rarely is in public education these days, what it is is utilitarian. So the point of an education right now for many is either to get the job, to earn money, to be successful, that phrase, right? Everybody hides behind that. Or to take a step down college preparatory, which is really just a dodge because then what's that preparing for? But in the absence of a clear telos, you end up with process becoming the end goal. This is really important. So what happens in the absence of an aim on the path, you're just walking the path. And then the point is it just becomes how, how, how good is the path? Not where is it headed, how good is the path? So it is like if you were um, trying to run a train and you were running it on a track and you got the train uh, to be as good a train as it could possibly be, the best wheels, the best everything, but you had absolutely no idea where the train was going. And this is what separates us from other schools is that whether we make it or not, whether we succeed or not, we are at least aiming somewhere and we are aiming to nothing less than the cultivation of good people. Now, as this con these people at this con um, conference are reminding us, um, and I, yes, you know, this was the dominant view of education until roughly uh, the beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century. Now, why it changed is, is, is you know, that's a long uh, discussion about the history of education we could talk about. Uh, but I want you to hear that Washington Latin is a school that is not embarrassed to say that we are trying to shape individuals. Uh, that that's fundamentally what we are doing. So number one, number two about what makes us different um, and classical is that we're not embarrassed um, to talk about words like truth, goodness, and beauty. Now, again, this may not, uh, yeah, you may think, what, don't all schools do that? Well, the answer is no, uh, because people have become so concerned and I'm not minimizing it by the idea uh, that um, we can't say what is true, what is good or what is beautiful. So let's just give up. Um, that's problematic for us. And of course it is thor thorny as to whose beauty and whose truth. But you know what, to raise a group of kids without any concept of those three transcendentals in our terms is a problem. So that separates us as well. And we ask our teachers to tell kids what it means to fall in love with the beautiful. This is the transcendental in education that I am particularly interested in. Uh, I love the symposium, Plato's symposium about the nature of love um, and the power of love uh, in forming an education. Uh, but um, 
One of the things people used to say to me is, you know, you get as close as possible to using religious language about education and in a secular school. And that's right. That's right. I get as close as possible to talking about education as holy work in our school, because you cannot run a school otherwise, in my mind. And if you don't put a path in place, if you don't put something at the end of the path, I'm telling you the school and the kids and the parents and the outside pressure will define it for you. There is no such thing as a valueless school. It doesn't exist. So if you're not careful that you don't have an end in mind and to us, the classical tradition provides that, then you're gonna end up with some other kind of end that you don't like. So first thing a tell off, second thing, not embarrassed to talk about truth, beauty, and goodness. The third, uh, and this is swimming upstream, we have a concept of shared humanity. That we all share some things. And I know that we're living in an era of diversity, of multiplicity, I'll get to that in a second. But a school is a community. And the students need to feel a sense of that. And they need to feel as if they're walking together on a path towards something that matters. And if we just keep reminding them how different they are from each other, it's very hard to develop that. For us, the thing that we really emphasize that all humans share is a wish to know, is curiosity a wish to understand, a wish to learn. You know, at one of my other schools that I was in, I was, uh, it was a K-12 school. Uh, and I, in the morning I would spend time with the little ones in the elementary and then in the middle of the day I'd go to the middle school and then in the afternoon I'd go to the high school. Um, I was the head of the academics there. And my day would start in idealism and end in, end in cynicism. And I thought, how did that happen? And we all know it's partly adolescence and those darn hormones. Believe me, I know a lot about them. Thanks for having Lynn with adolescence for 35 years. But there's also something that um, we do not maintain that idealism of the young, unless, unless we maintain it in the inspiration and beauty of a school vision. Shared humanity, just keep your minds on that one. So I'm talking more about the culture and the, to some degree, the curriculum. I've seen a note, somebody wants to know about the curriculum. We can talk about that in questions. Um, but the other thing that the ancients gave us is a pedagogy of seminar that is so absorbed into the culture. Um, it's now the business meeting, uh, it's, it's everything. Uh, it's so absorbed uh, that we forget that it is a unique pedagogy. And the pedagogy that I'm using right now um, is not the pedagogy that we use at Washington Latin very often. For a sad reason, partly, and that's that the attention span of the average American is about six seconds. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It is so short uh, that you have to keep changing what you're doing. So this pedagogy doesn't work. It's also not the pedagogy that engages the learner. So we use the pedagogy that is most transformative, which is the pedagogy that engages the learner in their own discovery. And there's so much has been written about the remarkable idea um, of Socrates, the midwife, um, who helps the student give birth to his or her own, own truth, process that's called myutic. Hunter, I hope I pronounced that right. The idea uh, is that the teacher brings out the truth or the learning in the student, and by that it is made his or her own. Telos, transcendentals, a focus on shared humanity, and a pedagogy of seminars are at the heart of, of who we are and what we mean by classical. Now, let me, let me go for a few more minutes and then we'll do some questions. Um, to a couple of things. First of all, our tagline is a classical education for the modern world. We are not trying to become a Benedictine monastery up on the hill away from the world. And I do think that some classical schools have a nostalgia at their heart 
that is a yearning for what's was for what once was. So my colleagues and I are committed to something that actually this is what's separating us right now from some of the people I'm with um, is is a willingness to take a hard look at the ancient tradition and see what its flaws were and to look at the modern world and see what its pluses are, both of which are there. The obvious one with the ancient world is uh, that the wonders of the education were not open to all. I mean, we know that. The plus of the modern world, a major plus of the modern world is of course this radical belief that all kids can learn and that all kids deserve a rich and full and liberal arts education. It was so moving the other night. I was doing the first, um, I was doing the first open house at our new campus um, and uh, we had people from all over the city. It, it's just, it's so moving. Uh, you watch people with no means, you watch people with lots of means, they're all coming together in service of this classical education. Uh, and I find it, I just find it so moving. Um, and I had the whole group in with me and there was a little boy um, and, I, and I asked them, why, why are you here? What, why, why are, why are you here kids? I asked the kids first and then I asked the parents. And um, one little boy said to me, um, well, I don't know, you tell me kind of thing. And we engaged in a little back and forth. And um, I said, well, we're here to free you. And he said, free me, this is not a free, this is school's like jail. And I said, no, in fact, the other way around, school is freeing. And he said, from what? And I said, well, from what, what do you think? And we were engaged in a real back and forth. And finally he said, I guess you mean freeing me from what I think about all the time. Really wonderful story when you think about it, right? He's saying, yes, yes, I wanna be freed from always what I think about. So opening me to new ideas, new possibilities, new perspectives, right? Which is at the heart of all liberal arts education. It was such a sweet moment. Um, and that is who we are. And that is one of the great virtues of the modern world is the diversity of perspectives that we have. It's just hard, hard, hard to honor them, embrace them, and also hold a whole together. It's hard. So let me tell you what I see as the virtues of this kind of education, this kind of classical education. You can guess them already from what I've said. Um, and then I'll tell you a couple of the, the, the real challenges that we're dealing with, and then let's start talking. Um, the first one I said uh, is um, the test score phenomenon. Um, and assessment. Now, I happen to be one who believes in accountability. One of the things I didn't like about private schools is the only thing uh, that really was holding people accountable was the list of colleges that kids got into at the end of their 12th grade year. Um, and that was what people declared as success. Um, that is not success. What success is, is who are those kids after they go through those schools? And who are they when they're mothers and fathers and brothers and voters and all those things? Um, it had such a narrow view of accountability. The public sector has done a much better job actually with accountability, except they've got a problem. It's, it's really hard to write an assessment for an entire school system. Everybody blames the test, says this is a bad test. This is, okay, you write a better one is partly my response to that. Um, but I mean, it's folly to think that schools shouldn't be held accountable. Of course we should be held accountable. And I have watched in the past 10 years while I've been in DC with people wrestling with this question and trying to figure out what does it look like to hold a school accountable? It's hard, it's hard. It's like holding a parent and saying, what, is make, what makes a good parent and how do we hold you accountable? It's just hard to do. Um, so I'm not anti-test, I'm anti-test that becomes the telos. That's the problem, is that in the name without another goal, the test, the assessment, the process becomes the end product and the goal. So that's one problem for education is that if you don't have someone who fully embraces a mission, then you fall prey to shining that training car that I was talking, that train car that I was talking about. And you also end up falling for everything because you don't know where you're going. 
A second challenge to this, and this is a real one, is the modern tendency to skepticism, cynicism, and deconstruction. The modern tendency that, no, no, that's not really what you mean. There's something underneath what you're saying. No, no, you don't really mean that. You're saying that because um, you were born in X place or you are X gender or you are this. So those may be good goals. For sure, skepticism is healthy. We need not to believe everything that we hear and see, I get it. But nobody is thinking about what a mature vision like that is doing to the young. That is not the vision for the young. We, we can't. We can't bring them into school, tell them that really beneath the words they're reading, there's really a hidden meaning under here. And then wonder when they say, I, 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 I can't do this. It's all hidden. I feel really strongly about this. You can hear it because I believe so strongly in the power of the inspirational vision of a school. If school doesn't inspire, it ought to close. Education has got to be inspirational. The word itself means breathing life in. And cynicism has no place in a school. You know, cynicism is failed idealism. That's somebody who just, the ideals failed. And so I'd ask us to be really careful about that. And this is one of the challenges with faculty, with young new faculty who have learned all the new methods of finding out what's under the truth. And they come and bring it to kids and they aren't willing to say things like, isn't that beautiful? Kids need to hear that. So that's a real challenge for us right now. The last one I'm gonna mention is um, one that I learned most about actually from my friend Hunter, who's on the call about many and one. Um, it's an ancient problem, right? The many and the one. How do you hold many things together in one whole while celebrating the parts, but at the same time holding it together? The country is struggling with this as we know, right? But so too do schools. And you have to be really careful not to just honor the diversity and the multiplicity of the perspectives at the expense of the whole. And so that's a real challenge. Without also so imposing your will that those multiple perspectives aren't seen anymore in any way. That I think in some way, besides scarcity of talent, which of course, my friends, is the most challenging thing for a school. Um, I think this, this country's got a reckoning coming about teachers and teaching. Uh, this pandemic has brought that up uh, in doing hiring this year. Um, I've never seen such a, a small pool of applicants. Um, people are realizing what hard work it is, I think, and we're going to have to really uh, think hard about that. So, uh, so I leave you with those words about a school I love, a tradition I love. Um, we're trying hard not to be a stuck in the mud old old fashioned school that uses quill pens and has never seen a, a computer. Um, and we're trying hard also not to be a place that dismantles everything that somebody might believe in, in the name of something that for young people is harder to believe in. So I leave you with that. Um, how do we do the question and answer, Jamel and uh, Jason? How does that work? Hey, so um, I think the best way to do it would be Either people can um, raise their hand, uh, which you can do like this um, from the reactions, and then we'll, uh, we'll sort of go in order. Or if you prefer, you can also, um, you can write your question in the chat box and then I will read it aloud um, like we're on a radio program and then uh, Di Diana can answer. So, right. Um, any questions from anyone in the group? I, I, if, we, if people need time to think to generate their question, I can start with one. Yeah. Um, which is, um, you know, essentially, it, I mean, I'm so, you know, I'm a, such a fan of, of what you're doing. And, you know, we try to do it at the Paideia Institute too in our own way. I can't believe that you have that connection to Werner Jaeger also. That's just so Isn't that cool. amazing? I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, 
but I, I, um, I think about this a lot and I, I feel like often you have to follow the money in these situations to like figure out the larger cultural forces that are um, acting upon us. And I, I've often thought this, you know, like as higher education continues to increase in its cost relative to everything else. So for each generation of students that's going to college, they're having to bar borrow, you know, more money, uh, even when you adjust for inflation and everything than the previous generation. Is that just creating like an impossible pressure cooker that makes the kind of work that you're talking about that much the harder? Because everybody, like there are just, people are under more pressure to succeed, as you call it, real financial pressure that uh, yep. could potentially dismantle their lives yep. and like are we going to be fighting an uphill battle forever to, to do character formation and humanistic education if that keeps happening basically yeah uh well jason you know we have in honor the expert on here about higher ed and so we should ask him uh that as well but i want to tell you something about the pressure that it's exerting on us that i find fascinating um, so when I was in the independent schools, as I said, uh, you know, it's a college prep group, right? They're going, they're going to college. When you ask them why, they don't know, uh, but they're going. Um, my constituents are mixed. I've got some of those kids who come from families that have had a three and four and five generations of college going, um, and they're going. I have some families who are first gen kids and who are going uh, because of that symbol uh, that is so important in the family and is exciting. Um, and then I have others that are beginning now and I've watched it happen over the past five years, it's recent, who are beginning to question whether or not going to college is worth it. Um, and I'm sure that's happening everywhere, right? Um, and who also interestingly are not convinced, and I don't know if this is an urban thing, I'm not sure because I'm bad at finances, um, uh, that they'll be able to get a living without going to college. Um, uh, th they don't believe the story that unless you have a college degree, you're not gonna earn a high wage. Um, they all have some image of the self-made person who's uh, made a lot of money and it's such a destructive image. Uh, for many kids, um, or as destructive as the NFL and the NBA image for many of my kids too. Um, so uh, I don't know that there's going to be more pressure on uh, what happens after uh, high school. I actually think something good may come of this, which it may help reform what high school is all about, because it may in fact be the end of the game for many people. I've always said, uh, if, if we turn out a forest ranger who reads Homer at night, I am ecstatic. Um, and, and if that is not, uh, you don't have to go to college to uh, be a forest ranger, okay. Um, so I think what this is doing, first of all, it's challenged that phrase college prep, Jason. Um, which so many schools have used uh, as their explanation for why they exist. Um, so I don't know enough to know what's going to happen to higher ed, but I'm sure, Hunter, you think something's going to happen soon. Something must be going on. The community college, the, their enrollments are through the roof. Uh, and uh, so I would ask, Hunter, what do you think is going to happen now with higher ed? Can he talk, Jason? Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I, I don't have any great crystal ball and I'll be really brief, uh, but uh, I do think that um, enrollment in the humanities majors is now down permanently. Ugh. So we just have to accept that. It's been going down gradually, slowly over the years. And I've always been an optimist, but I'm not really an optimist anymore. I think it's a permanent condition on the other hand, many humanities departments are doing a fine job of teaching courses that attract students, not majors necessarily, but students into their classes. And many of those students get inspired by reading literature or doing history. And so these uh, departments are doing really fairly well overall in attracting a lot of students into their programs. Some of the problems they've had were of course uh, self-imposed 
in the sense that um, deconstruction is not really what 19 and 20 year olds want to be studying. They want to be studying Shakespeare for Shakespeare, um, not for philosophical uh, lessons brought by the French. Um, so it's a, um, it's a mixed bag, I would say, but I'm not, I'm not too disheartened because I, I think that enrollments in courses are, are fairly good at a number of schools, but the majors, yes, definitely down for the reasons we can all appreciate, namely uh, parents in particular are saying, look, um, uh, Johnny, uh, you, you have to take a major that's going to get you a job. And, and given the financial situation, it, that's understandable. I, I used to get very frustrated by it, but at least I understand it now. Yep. Okay, we've got some other people on deck here. Um, Mark uh, Reuter, you're next. And then Steve. Mark, are you still here? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> hey, Mark. Um, uh, hi, hi, Dan. Uh, um, I'm a little flustered because I uh, just had uh, uh, some technological problems and my question has kind of evaporated a little bit, but um, I, I just want to say first and foremost that I'm extremely grateful for your talk. It's, uh, it's, I feel uh, uh, the only regret I have is that uh, I, I couldn't come to work for you because I've recently retired. <laughs> I really uh, find my heart uh, warming up to the, the things you mentioned about education. And I appreciate your challenges. And I, I, I thought you were going to say I, I just wanted to draw you out a little bit uh, on saying something about the pluses of a school like that and yeah. the culture like that. Yeah. Um, I, I think you got cut a little bit short. Yep. Um, and I, I wonder, I, I think one of the things that I struggle with is that when you are really value a genuine education, like that point you made about freedom with that young uh, student who was applying, I find it so alienating from the culture. Do, can you say anything of how you might handle that or do you experience that? Uh, tell me what you mean uh, alienating from our, alienating from what? Well, it's uh, like the, the whole kind of uh, postmodern, uh, like you're just, you're just so yeah. on the outside of all of that. It's, 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 and, and that seems to be such a dominating voice that it's hard to hang on to yourself. Yeah, um, it is hard to hang on to yourself. I agree with that completely. Um, but I am, um, uh, and you're right, I uh, didn't do the benefits as much as I did the challenges because that's typical what lives in my head. But um, I'm struck, Mark, by, we have 2,500 people on our waiting list. So something's going on and I'll tell you, it's not because they want to learn the third declension. Um, it, it, it isn't. Uh, it, it, because a lot of people think that we teach Spanish, not Latin. Um, so I think there is a deep human need for meaning, a deep human for belief, for meaning, for idealism. I, I, I think it's, it's in us. And uh, so, you know, when I hear Diana, you're naive, Diana, you're too idealistic, Diana, you're pie in the sky, that, good that's what education needs to be um i uh so i think mark you just gotta I, I i think we have to be positive about the fact that that a lot of people are yearning for this a lot so fascinating to me again back to the cooper uh open house where i asked the parents why are you here and most of them said not surprised not uh cynical you're a tier one successful school Okay, we know that, right? We go to the places that are successful and uh, that tier one means that we have high test scores. Um, now we partly have high test scores because we have middle-class kids. Sorry, it's not all value added. It's not just because we're great. We are good, okay? But that's not the only reason. I've got kids that have been reading since age three and I've got kids that didn't hear a multi-syllable word until they were 12. So I've got the whole gamut. Um, and uh, I still believe the following components of a school will always make people come to it. One is small. 
parents want small schools. They want kids to be known. Now, some yearn for the big marching band and the football, and the, but the average American high school is 2,000 students. It's too big. So until we do something about that, this is one of the reasons that people flock to our school um, to say nothing of the very practical matter of, I, I, you know, I can keep them safer if it's small. I, I actually know what people are bringing in, what's going out. I mean, you know, that's a big deal these days. Schools are not safe. So um, I, I think that's one benefit is the small size. Um, I think the other benefit is a notion that maybe we could talk about things here. I think people think so bottled up that they can't, uh, you know, I'm going to step on somebody's toes. I'm going to offend. I'm going to do. So I think the fact that we have normalized conversation um, around thorny ideas, um, we're not perfect, but we're doing pretty well on that. I think that helps too. But above uh, all, I think it's because it's a life affirming mission, Mark. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Just a quick follow up. Um, is, is your approach to the seminar influenced at all by the work that happens at Phillips Exeter? Yeah. Yeah. So the thing about Exeter, um, have I got ever any Exonians on here? Um, uh, the thing about Exeter is, you know, they have the cream of the crop, my friends. Um, I, I mean, they have uh, 12 well-fed, uh, well-dressed, smart kids around the table. Now, I'm not saying, you know, somebody once told me when I got all snarky that rich kids have souls too, and it's absolutely right, right? Um, and, uh, but uh, we do send teachers to Exeter. Uh, Brian, did you go? Did you go to Exeter, Brian? Sorry, I got a me? colleague here. Yeah. No, 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 no. No, I don't mean I, did you go there. I mean, did you go to the workshop? No, I did not. Okay. No. All right. Uh, so we do, Mark, we send people to their workshop. For those of you who don't know, that's the Harkness table uh, idea. And that is the private school that uh, popularized that. Um, and the idea is you get 14, uh, 12 to 14, you know, the disciples were a good seminar group. Uh, you get 14 around the table. Uh, you know, when I went up there to learn about it, uh, I found out the tables cost $22,000 themselves. Uh, and you could do it without, without a table. Uh, but their method of doing seminars is very good. And so that, that was a long-winded answer to yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next up is uh, Steve Foley. I have a quick comment really in response to the Hunter and the education cost thing that Jason raised. Uh, and then a question on the Latin curriculum specifically. One is I think we've got to keep in mind that education is disaggregating. Absolutely. There's a huge sure. difference between education and credentialization. And you can get a fabulous education online from any number. You can take a full engineering degree for free at MIT. Right. And then you can get credentialized at Cornell. You, but the, the, they're two different. The question is how much people are going to spend for credentialization. Yep. And at some point, how much employers are going to value credentialization as opposed to education. So that's as, it, as, the, as the credentialization starts to get out of control in terms of cost, that's one thing. Second is, I think that if you want to look why people are not taking the humanities, one reason, not the only. I mean, you could get perfectly good job prospects out of Cornell, I went there, by taking humanities and getting taking 10 accounting courses and getting your CPA and taking enough math courses that you had some quantitatives and some statistics, that's those are, but I mean, the math part is so much harder than any of the humanities parts. It's like going to a different school. It's just much more difficult. Uh, but so a lot of people don't want to do that, but, but you, could, you could be a classics major and still have very good job prospects if you did other things. Uh, but the issue is gonna be the cost and the credentialization, but in terms of the humanities, the, the bloviation that goes on now is beyond belief. I mean, the, the poster child, from my point of view, is that you go on to Yale and put in John Milton, and there's this little pipsqueak who comes up who's a full professor there, he's about 30 years old, and he starts talking about male privilege and the rest of this stuff, and you just want to get off. And I had my daughter taking Shakespeare from a UCL Renaissance literature grad in London, 
first and run a book from University College London, who does tutoring. And it is the best Shakespeare course I've ever had. I had one at St. Albans in high school in Washington, DC, and one at University of Michigan, uh, undergrad. Uh, and this guy is 10 miles above that, but it's not deconstruction. It's actually, what did Shakespeare mean to say the rest of it? So it's a, I think partly the humanities is like Reagan's joke about the Democratic Party. I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. And I think humanities has basically abandoned most normal people. So I think there's a substantive issue. Mm -hmm. uh, just to specific questions on curriculum. I understand from the, from the text that you start Latin in the fifth grade and then have four mandatory years. Yes, that's right. Do you have extra years if you want to take Latin all the way through? Absolutely. We, you, you could take it for uh, all eight, nine years that you're there if you want. We also have ancient Greek. Fabulous. Do you, what, what are the, how are they reading? Are you, do you, I guess two sort of related questions. Uh, do you do spoken Latin and how well are they reading or speaking by the end of the fourth year and by the end of the eighth year? Yeah, I've got one of our, our uh, Latin teachers here and, and Brian Whitchurch, who's an advocate and a superstar of the uh, spoken approach. Um, this guy can speak Latin. So amazing. It's so cool. Um, uh, uh, we're, we're doing a mixture, I think we would say. Uh, we are doing some spoken, uh, um, but uh, we're also doing the old fashioned analytic uh, grammar and translation approach. Um, oddly, I, I'm, I'm teaching Latin again uh, after a hiatus, and I'm using this book uh, by Orberg, Hans Orberg. I'm using it, Brian. Um, and uh, amazing book. Uh, yeah, spoken, yeah, yeah, I use Spoken that. language, unbelievable. Have, so, you ever, have you ever seen the Bavarium Novarum courses? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm taking one I of those. I could just now. jump in. Um, I really like what Steve had to say, and the fact that he's a Cornelian ain't bad either, but. <laughs> um, Steve, you might be interested to know that th there's a student at Cornell now, a sophomore from the Washington Latin School, who did quite a lot of Latin at um, the Latin School and quite a lot of Greek. And um, when she went off to Cornell uh, a couple of years ago, the first year was not on campus because of COVID and she had worries in her family. Uh, she just took all her classes online. And I checked with colleagues in classics at Cornell to say, how's, how's she doing? You know, I'm just kind of interested. I don't want to name her because it's embarrassing, but, um, and one of my colleagues wrote back and said, Hunter, she's the best student in Latin of all of our Latin students. She's a freshman and her Latin's better than anyone else's. Wow, I was, congratulations. I was very struck by that. Just, just totally struck by that. Now that she must be a Great curriculum. I took five years of Latin at St. Albans and I couldn't do a thing. So that you were doing <laughs> something right. <laughs> Jason, can we get Katie? She's been patient and also had some <clears throat> questions in the chat. Yes. Um, yes. I, uh, I'm sorry. So I'm just, I'm following an order here. And oh. um, Judith Levins had a question. So I just want to make sure we respect the order here. Uh, Katie is a dear friend too. And, and she'll be, no, that's okay. So she's next. So, um, so uh, let me just you, jump in. I'm willing to wait. So I, I, I have, <laughs> thank you. I have the time, so it is not a problem. So thank you, Katie. Okay. Yeah. We'll just ask Judith Levins, uh, uh, wrote her question and she's just asking, how would you suggest finding schools with similar aims if you don't live in DC? Uh, if, uh, you send me an email, um, at, uh, I'll put it in the chat, um, and where you are, Judith, um, I will uh, be happy to look up uh, some classical schools for you. Um, uh, of course, that does not mean that, um, you know, they're all, they're different. So I, I can also teach you how to look for some things to know what kind of classical school it is. I'd be happy to do that. Great. Okay. Uh, Katie, finally, <laughs> you're up. No problem. Um, first, I'd like to push back against Steve a little bit. You seem like you're an elite grad of some elite places. Um, I actually teach at a really elite school. Um, you called a professor a pipsqueak. Um, there's real suffering for these for these people who are 
living a life of deconstruction. I see it in my students. I see it in my colleagues. Um, and so while I disagree profoundly with what they're teaching and how they're living, um, I try to remain respectful of their humanity. I think that's what we're talking about. So um, that's, that's something I think in the modern world, if we're talking about diversity, we're talking about allowing more people in. And I think if we, um, that's something that I think is really, you know, I live, I live, I work at a really elite private school and I am a minority where I am. Um, and so I, you know, I see what this is costing people. And so I would say, um, if we're, if we're going to reach people, um, I think we have to be respectful, even if maybe they're not. Uh, so that's just my two cents. Um, Diana, I'm working right now on a program at my school um, in ancient Mediterranean studies. And um, it's everything that you said is something I'm trying to incorporate. How do we, how do we maintain diversity and unity? You know, um, what it, can we keep the American project going? Um, given that we, um, we've always been doing this and this is kind of apparently our, um, our opportunity to keep this going. So I would love if you are interested um, to show you what I'm doing um, and to maybe get your feedback um, and to, um, because I think I am approaching that issue of modern diversity. Um, I've talked with Jason about this. So if you're interested, I'll email you the, the draft proposal that I have. I have a committee for next year working on it. Um, and how do we take this sort of rich heritage that we have, examine it with an eye to including as many people in it as possible, and then um, and keeping it going. So uh, that's not really a question so much. Oh, I'd be happy to. Katie, yeah, I'd be happy um, to. It. Yeah. Um, and appreciation for what you're doing and also, um, yeah, and, and some help on how to move forward with it and meeting with people with like-minded people who are, and especially because your school is so different from mine. And I think it, I think it actually does the mission that my school wishes. It did. That, that's what, that, that's exactly the way I felt about it when I was uh, in the independent schools. Now I, I feel like we're actually living it right. Yeah. Uh, history is, of, history is of course the subject where it's hardest uh, to know what we're doing. Uh, so I'd be happy to please uh, get in touch. My email's in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's keep moving. Next is uh, our good friend, Justin. Justin Schwamm. Katie, thank you so much. Um, and Diana, thank you. I'm, it's funny because I am in DC for a few weeks with some friends of mine and I thought, huh, maybe there's a reason. Maybe there's a reason. I may, I, I'll, I'll be in touch with you about that. I'm excited to hear what you all are, are doing in the way that you're really walking the talk. And our, what, a thing that resonated for me was at the very beginning when you were talking about how both classical and school are words that we just don't define. And it seems like um, it's particularly important in this time of, of just dramatic paradigm change. Um, I guess that gets to my question or observation, which is that I do a lot of work with, with teachers who are examining their practice and with homeschooling families who aren't sure what their practice should be. And with some with adult learners who aren't sure what, you know, what, it, what even should that be. And I've been noticing that there's, there are different categories of practice. There are different models of practice that underlie those. And it seems like underneath those, there are narratives about what the practice should be. I love the fact that you all are so open about what your narrative is. And I think that's, that's really, um, that's the observation. And the question is, um, what are some of the other narratives that you all are noticing and that are leading to that Aprea state at the classical uh, conference? Because I mean, having been to and around a few of those, I think I know what they are, but um, I wonder if, if, if you can name them. 
Yeah, for sure. And and uh, please do let me know if you're in DC. I'd be happy to take you around the school. It's it's uh, moving uh, to be there. Um, uh, so, uh, what one is? Um, see, I'm 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 in this state. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you have a veneration for the, um, well, let me put it this way: school keeping requires clarity and ambiguity simultaneously. And that is hard. Uh, the clarity comes from uh, being clear about who you are um, and what you believe in and giving teachers a North Star. Um, but you also want to be uh, have an allegiance to what I call the wrinkled brow, uh, which is what you ultimately want to do for kids is wrinkle the brow, right? Not so fast. Not so fast. You think this is the case, that's the case, not so fast. So um, the other leaders and I have that attitude towards the tradition and therefore we can undercut the very thing that is um, fueling us. And one of the issues that I'm hearing here right now is go out and be a warrior. Uh, for one thing, there's too much uh, veneration for the warrior aspect of classical culture. I, I, uh, finding it a little weird. Uh, so when you ask about narratives that I'm responding to, um, and also this sense that the world is going to hell in a handbasket and classical education is gonna save it. I, I, I just get uncomfortable with things, statements like that. So I'm, I think probably Justin, that that's the best I can do. Um, and then of course, you know, I mean, the Christian classical schools have an easier uh, go of it in that the, they can use that language. So I think that's it. Um, yeah. Okay, oh, so, thank it's, you so it's, much. it's 108. Um, I think we should uh, maybe take one more question and then if people have follow-up questions, they could uh, email Diana. Um, uh, okay, so, yeah. so the... the the last one is from Katie Movich. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, she says she's curious what specific aspects of culture you want to bring to the Cooper campus and which you don't. You mentioned this earlier, but I'm not sure you got into specifics. And then she notes that her internet connection has dropped a few times. So she may have just missed it if you already said it, but I don't think you, you did. Thanks, Jason, for taking that one as the last one. And thanks uh, uh, for who, Cynthia, is that her first name? Uh, Katie. Katie, thanks, Katie, for asking it, um, because this is pretty much what I've been working on for a year. Um, uh, we're also working with an, an, an agency to do icons um, uh, for us, iconography of um, a classical culture. Try, try boiling uh, some of this into icons. It's really interesting. Uh, with a company that's done mostly Starbucks kind of thing. Um, anyway, uh, one of the uh, cultural uh, components that we wanna keep is what we're calling fall in love with enduring ideas. Uh, so that's part of our culture, which is the intellectual part of our culture. I hate to say this, but um, uh, a lot of schools are not intellectual places. I, I mean, it's sad but it's just true, right? Uh, they're not intellectual places. So uh, one of them is that, fall in love with enduring ideas. Um, another one uh, we're calling seek the conversation. So in other words, get into dialogue. Uh, words matter is one of our un, un, uh, sung or, un, or in, what is it? Un, informal uh, taglines. And so we care deeply about the conversation. So we've built benches in the hallway for kids to sit and talk with each other and that sort of thing. Um, another aspect of the culture that we want to keep is called uh, courageous trust. Um, at the heart of our school is trust um, in uh, the young people we're working with, but also in the adults. This is the number one thing I hear about why faculty want to come to us is that we give them autonomy um, and treat them as professionals. So uh, that's another part of the culture that we want to keep. And the last one we can't get right, but it's something around the common good um, and building a culture around a notion of common good. So those are four that we're after. You asked about things that we, we don't want to keep, uh, which I find um, very interesting. Uh, I, I'm just going to say two words. Cell phone 
it is it is corrosive to a school culture. And I was I, I'm just going to talk about this for one second, Jason, and then we'll go. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not a banner. I, I don't like banning things. Uh, I don't like the canceling. I, I it just doesn't feel like it's an educating posture to me. Uh, but I, I'm right close to telling those new principals to ban those phones. Um, it's ruining our 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 ability to talk to one another in culture with the young. I'm not the adults. I mean, I you know, hello, good luck trying to get that to happen with them. But um, so we can't end on that gloomy note, though. Uh, come uh, if you're in D.C. and would like to come by and see the school, either of them. Um, and or to learn anything about Anna Julia Cooper, uh, please do. I, I'd be happy to have anybody. And uh, Jamel and Jason, really, thanks so much for uh, including me here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Diana. And thanks, thanks to everyone for, for coming. Uh, it's given us a lot to think about and a lot of really interesting um, sort of themes that you're wrestling with. So thank you for your work. And um, Keep it up. Keep up. Keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> you too. Uh, look forward you to too. seeing you in person sometime. All right. All right. Take care, bye everybody. Bye. bye bye. Thanks, Jamel. Nice to see you. Thank you, Diana. Good to see you too.